Hi, this is Orion, and you're listening to Orion's Bedtime Stories Podcast. Well, I have a number of short stories and fairy tales here. For the next little while, I'll be sharing a large chapter book with you. Illusion by Paula Volsky. For 200 years, the exalted classes have ruled over Vonar by virtue of their dazzling magical abilities. Now, their powers grown slack from disuse, they concentrate on the pleasures their station affords them, ignoring the misery of the lower classes. It is only when the red tide of revolution sweeps aside all distinctions of rank, home, and family that the exalted realize the gravity of their mistake. Thrust into the very center of the conflict is the beautiful Elise Faux de Raval, spirited daughter of a provincial landowner. Now, like those she disdained, she must scramble for bread in the teeming streets of the capital city, the key to her abilities and elusive secret, and find a way to survive in a world gone mad with liberty. Orion's Bedtime Stories is proudly brought to you by Anchor FM. And if you've not heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Firstly, it is free, and they have creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Then they distribute your podcast for you so you can be heard on Spotify, Apple, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership required. So you have everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. So... Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. Hi there, and welcome to Orion's Bedtime Stories. Um, I am reading to you the book Illusion by Paula Volsky, and this is chapter four. Drift's disappearance caused a sensation. No serf had ever successfully fled the Daraval estate. No fugitive had ever remained at liberty for longer than a week. Generally, they returned of their own accord, defeated, chastened, and justly terrified of the seigneur's wrath. The more stubborn cases were delivered by wagon like trussed-up parcels, the lucky ones. Less fortunate offenders ran behind their captors' horses, or else they were dragged. Four years earlier, the Marquis had purchased a brace of hounds whose near-supernatural tracking ability inspired a healthy terror. Since then, no one had dared attempt flight, until now. Dref Zenoson's incentive was considerable, and his resourcefulness proverbial. No doubt, he'd give the hounds a good run. The more enterprising among the house servants were already taking odds on the sortie's duration. The most enthusiastic partisans gave Dreff a full week of freedom. But such was the esteem in which the escapee was held that no one bet on anything less than three days. The odds changed abruptly when it became known that the dogs had followed a cold trail as far as the king's highway, where they lost the scent once and for all. The most likely explanation involved the fugitive's use of wheeled transportation, but the means whereby he had procured such remained mysterious. No farm wagon would have carried him out of the district, no private carriage would have paused for a shabby pedestrian, and the Shireen stage would not have taken him on unless he could pay. Fresh from his stable prison, Dreff surely carried no money and would have had access to none, in which case his apparent discorporation at the side of the road partook of the miraculous. The admiration of the serfs rose accordingly. As the days passed and the fugitive remained at large, new hope was born, and whispered conversation centered upon the previously unthinkable, that Dref Zinosen would evade capture altogether that Dref Zinosen was free. It was the stuff of which legends were made. The Marquis Vauderaval failed to share in the burgeoning enthusiasm. 
Thwarted and flouted, the seigneur turned his anger upon the nearest and most obvious culprit, Borlo Bunison, whose job it had been to guard the prisoner Zenison throughout the night. Borlo was sent for and questioned, whereupon the wretched smith recounted a ridiculous tale. It seemed that giant wolves with fiery eyes had chased him from his sentry post. He had only just managed to escape with his life. Never mind the fact that wolves commonly held to the high ground, seldom venturing from the hills save in winters of direst famine. Never mind the fact that no wolf of any description, much less giant, had been seen upon Darval land in years. Or that wolves were retiring beasts, ordinarily disinclined to confront human beings. Never mind all that. Borlo clung doggedly to his silly story, thus, catch it, thus casting much doubt upon his own veracity, sobriety, and sanity. For it became clear, in the face of rigorous interrogation, that he genuinely believed in his tale's truth. Following his flight from the stable, he had roused the coachman, sleeping in the carriage house, with demands for assistance. The coachman, compliant enough, had of course seen nothing, but the incident itself seemed to verify the strength of the smith's convictions, if nothing more. A swift search of the area had revealed no wolves, and Borlow, armed with the coachman's borrowed pistol, had returned to his abandoned post. Never intellectually inclined, the smith did not think to check on the prisoner, and Drefzinosin's flight was not discovered until the next morning. Liar, lunatic, or simple drunkard, the bungler was going to pay. Punishment was promptly administered by the seigneur himself, and for once Borlo Bunison stood on the wrong side of the whip. The smith endured half a dozen quick strokes of a handy riding crop before he was permitted to depart in disgrace. Borlo's debt had been paid, but the marquis was far from appeased. For days, his search parties combed the district. Notices and descriptions were posted in every village for miles around, and a small reward was offered for the return of the runaway serf, all to no avail. No one had so much as glimpsed the fugitive in passing. Dref Zunison had vanished into thin air. And along with Dref vanished his sister, or so it initially appeared. The morning following Zen Subison's death and Dref's escape, Elise awoke to find her rooms silent and untended. The music box, whose notes ordinarily roused her from slumber, had not been wound. The requisite goblet of chilled fruit juice was absent from its usual place on the stand beside her bed. Her clothes had not been laid out, and Prince Vauplume had not been fed. It really would not do. Frowning, she rose, stalked to the closet housing Stelly's pallet, and rapped imperiously. No response from within, and she kicked open the door. The closet was empty. Stelly's meager possessions were gone. Seriously annoyed now, Elise yanked the bell pull hard. Minutes later, one of the housemaids answered the summons to finish to furnish the assistance her young mistress required in dressing. Elise asked after Stelly and learned that the maid had been seen leaving the manor house, sack upon her back, at the break of dawn. Had the girl followed in Dref's footsteps? Reluctant to draw the matter to the Marquis's attention, Elise made, made discreet inquiries among the house servants. Hours later, she discovered that Steli Zeno's girl had been spotted entering her father Zeno's cottage early in the morning. So the stupid, irresponsible wench had simply cleared off, without notice, without permission, and without the slightest consideration of her master's needs. 
She would rather sulk in a hovel than serve in the manor house as a lady as a lady's maid. Very well, good riddance. It would be easy enough to drag her back, but best let her stay where she was. She might grub in the fields until her hands were raw and her stiff-spined back was breaking, if that's what she wanted, and it would serve her right. She didn't know when she was well off. She was an ungrateful fool, and she'd always been a wretched maid. Moreover, her voluntary departure simplified matters. There would be no awkwardness involved in finding a replacement. For some days past, Elise had had her eye on little Kirith, the dairymaid, and now she summoned the child for a brief interview. Well, perhaps not quite a child. Kirith was all of fifteen, healthy and well-grown, but her round, freckled face, tiny, snub nose, and wide blue eyes lent her an infantile air. She was medium-sized, slender, useful in that she might easily stand in for her new mistress during dress fittings, and her braided hair, pinned into a neat coronet, was a shade of honey not unlike Elise's own. Best of all, the girl was nothing like Steli. Her manner was respectful but vivacious. She moved lightly, her voice was soft, and her blue eyes rested on the Marquise's daughter with an expression of undisguised, uncomplicated admiration. It was so agreeable that Elise engaged her upon the spot. She soon discovered that she had stumbled upon a treasure. Dazzled by the glory of her sudden ascent from dairy to manor house, Kareth seemed to have made some secret vow to be the best maidservant the world had ever seen, and it was likely she'd succeed before long. True, she was inexperienced, unaccustomed to dealing with the complexity of ruffles and ruchings, ignorant of lace-mending techniques, sometimes a little confused between morning and afternoon dress, but she was hard-working, sunny-natured, quick to learn, and more important, eager to learn. She had a clever eye for color and form, very useful in coordinating accessories. She possessed a natural, magical ability to coax her new mistress's long tresses into the most flattering puffs and curls, and she knew how to beguile the temperamental Prince Vauplume. There was still a lot of packing left and not much time. Kirth threw herself into the task, accomplishing more in three days than Steli had managed in the preceding three weeks. Never had packing been managed so deftly. Kirth handled Elise's possessions with care amounting to reverence, wrapping each article in tissue paper prior to careful storage. Before the week was out, the heaped garments had disappeared from armchairs and window seat. Mending and cleaning were perfectly completed. The boxes and trunks scattered about the bedchamber were filled with meticulously wrapped packages, each coated with colored string, according to Kirth's own system, with scented sachets embedded between the layers. Jewelry was polished and packed away in quilted satin rolls. Flagons of perfume, stoppered crystal vials, powder jars, hand mirrors, and similar breakables nested safe in their own straw-lined crate. It was done beautifully, and Kirth finished it all with time to spare. So excellent was her work, and so pleasant her company, that Elise soon forgot that the hostile, defiant presence known as Steli Zeno's girl had ever existed to trouble her. During that time, Elise remained alert to all mention of Dref Zinosen's name. At first, she expected to hear of his recapture, but the hours passed, then the days, and no such news reached her. Gradually, her uneasiness began to subside. Fortunately, no one thought to connect Barlow 
Borlo Bunison's idiot tale of wolves with the magical illusions of which Uncle Quince was a known master. Quince Vauderaval was so retiring, his demeanor so mildly innocent, his visits to the estate so infrequent, that even his family members tended to overlook his existence. In any event, what possible reason might Quince Vauderaval have to interfere with the Marquis's administration of justice? Fortunately again, very fortunately, Elise's involvement in the affair went unproved, if not altogether unsuspected. Her father interrogated her only once, but at some length. For the space of an endless hour and a half, she sat as if nailed to a chair in his study while he plied her with question after question. She responded blandly and fluently, inwardly praying that her schooled composure masked the sickening uneasiness that roiled at the pit of her stomach. She sensed that he did not quite believe her, but he extracted no confession, and no shred of evidence existed to implicate her. At last, the Marquis professed his guiding, his grudging satisfaction, and Elise was permitted to depart. Thankfully, she fled the study. She was safe. The week galloped by, and then it was time to go. Elise's departure was a fairly great occasion, with parents, visiting cousins, a couple of maiden aunts, and assorted servants assembled at the great front entrance to see her off at dawn. There, on the white graveled drive that circled before the broad stone stairway, waited the second best carriage, which was to carry her all the way to Shireen. Second best or no, the big Berlin was imposing, with shining, freshly varnished sides, scarlet trim, polished brass, brass studs, and the Derivelle arms blazoned on the door. The rack on the roof was piled high with her baggage, neatly strapped and buckled. The coachman sat on the double perch, scarlet reins and whip in hand, the four matched greys, eager to be off, stamped and fretted. Long before the journey was over, their eagerness would wane. Beside the coachman sat one of the stoutest of the footmen, attired in the midnight green Derivelle livery and conspicuously armed. Adieus were formal and scarcely heartfelt. At least cared little for her vaporing, self-absorbed mother and vice versa. The aunts and cousins were almost strangers. The servants were, for the most part, pleasant, self-effacing non-entities, which was all that they were permitted to be. She had already bid a fond farewell to the one family member she cared about, Uncle Quinn's, and the only other person who mattered was gone for good. There remained her father, whose sense of propriety now dictated a display of moderate paternal devotion. Following a tedious but mercifully brief spate of advice and instructions, the Marquis handed his daughter down the broad stone stairway, led her to the carriage, bent his head to kiss her lightly once on each cheek. The unwelcome contact chilled her. Into her mind, quite unexpectedly, popped the vivid, the vivid image of her own prettily buffed pink fingernails raking across the Marquise's fair, indifferent face to draw blood. Now, where had that come from, and why? A rush of revulsion followed. To save her life, Elise could not have returned to those empty kisses. Arranging her features into a dutiful smile, she swept her father a low curtsy and quickly entered the carriage. Behind her came Kerth, carrying Prince Vauplume under her right arm. In her left hand, the maid bore a hamper containing food, drink, games, puzzles, lap desk with writing and sketching supplies, embroidery hoop and silks, books, poems, and anything else likely to ease the tedium of a long journey. One of the footmen folded up the stair and closed the door behind Kerith. It shut with a final-sounding snap. At last, 
a chorus of farewells, a flutter of waving handkerchiefs, a crack of the coachman's whip, creaks and rattles, and they were off at a trot. With a yap of ecstasy, Prince Faux Plume exploded from Kerth's grasp to fling himself crazily from seat to seat, fast and unpredictable as furry shrapnel. Then, initial hysteria subsiding, he jumped into his mistress's lap, reared up, and thrust his silky white head out the window. Elise followed suit. Behind her, a knot of relatives and retainers stood waving. Her parents, she noted, had already disappeared. She waved once, then withdrew and did not look back again. At first it seemed a great thing to be traveling to Shireen, all grown up and on her own for the first time. Here she was, mistress of the family's second best conveyance for the duration of the journey, with money of her own to spend as she pleased, a maid instead of a governess to attend her, and no one in sight to tell her what to do. The new freedom was exciting, and she chose to taste of it immediately by doing what she never would have dared to do in the presence of her parents or teachers, making herself comfortable. It was going to be another hot day. Early morning, though it was, the air was already warm and glue-heavy. Before the carriage reached the big, lion-headed stone pillars at the end of the drive, she had stripped the white lace gloves from her hands and the blossomy hat from her head. Off came the cropped, tight-fitting broadcloth jacket of her blue-gray traveling costume. Off came the high, white long fichu swathing her throat. Off came the earrings heavy bracelets, and pointed gray kid slippers. For many hours, until they stopped for the midday meal at some inn, probably in the town of Grumantes, she would be seen by nobody other than Kirth, who was scarcely apt to disapprove. Kirth herself, in her loose, yoked blouse, drawstring skirt, and scuffed sandals, was the picture of comfort. The carriage rumbled along the steep dirt lane that led down to the village of Daraval. The way was familiar and the scene humdrum, but Elise, in departing, viewed her surroundings with new interest, and thus could not help but note the dreary squalor of her father's domain. The mean little houses were rickety and tumble-down. Fences were broken and thatching black with, with rot. Garbage and ordure lay everywhere. Rats ranged openly, and a number of the grimy toddlers already playing beside the road were large-eyed and pinch-faced with hunger. Can't these animals even bother to bury their own filth? She wondered, and then the thought came unbidden. What good would it do them to even try in such a foul sty as this? A proper seigneur would finance repairs. But that was a tiresome matter with which she did not concern herself to think of, and in any event, no business of hers. Daraval was so small, the carriage passed straight through in a matter of minutes, rattling on along the narrow tributary road that would shortly merge with the king's highway. Elise surveyed with appreciation the rolling countryside for which her home province of Fabec was renowned. The hills were steep but rounded, still green despite the hot weather. No other region in all Vonar possessed meadows so intensely green or soil so richly black, and nowhere else, certainly, were such huge and fragrant orchards to be found. The orchards stretched on for miles, and the tart, spicy fruit they yielded was the source of the famous Fabrique cider and the even more famous Fabrique apple brandy. Her eyes cut across to Kerith, who was staring out the window, entranced. The scenery was lovely, but surely not that extraordinary. Then Elise smiled as she recalled that this was the first time Kareth had ever ventured beyond the village of Daraval. 
If the child thought this was remarkable, just wait until she saw Shireen. Within the hour, they had reached the King's Highway, a broad, rutted, well be well-traveled way curving south through the beck like a low, dusty river, through the villages and hamlets, through ancient, sleepy towns such as Grimantes, Fluvine, and Beronde, before crossing the Neares into Sivang province, a great lush expanse of lake-riddled farmland, at whose southernmost point the capital city of Shireen straddled the river Veer like a colossus. And a colossus she was, the largest, most vital, most exciting city in all Vonar, perhaps in all the world, center and source of jeweled dreams. The hours passed, and the novelty of the excursion began to pall. Prince Vo Plume quick quickly losing interest in the great green world that he so rarely glimpsed, curled up on the tufted leather seat and went to sleep. Elise took up a book of poetry and began to read, undeterred by the jolting motion of the carriage. Only Kirth remained glued to the window, fascinated by the endlessly changing panorama of hills, meadows, farmland, and village. Twice during the morning, they stopped to rest and water the horses, the second time in a tiny village whose name, if it had one, at least did not know. Kerth got out of the carriage to walk Prince Vo Plume and returned a short time later, bubbling over with excitement at her discovery of a village well that differed significantly in construction from the well at Derival. At least did not trouble to leave her seat. She was, she decided, growing bored. Her boredom subsided in the early afternoon when they rolled into the town of Germantes, with its intact medieval city wall, its cobbled streets, quaintly gabled and timbered houses, and its ancient guild halls of rose-flecked fabrique granite. Kirtha was almost overwhelmed at the sight, and even at least perked up. There were several shops scattered along the length of the main thoroughfare, and the market square contained a moss-covered fountain flanked by old stone benches. Just off the square stood the smiling sergeant, an inn of good reputation. Through the gate and into the courtyard a carriage clattered, the carriage clattered. It stopped before the entrance, and Elise hastily readjusted her appearance before alighting for her midday meal. She was quite aware of the stir she created with her fine carriage and horses, her smart clothes, and her little retinue of maid, lapdog, coachman, and footman. When she swept into the smiling sergeant, she knew that every curious eye in the room was fixed on her. Never before had she felt so adult, more than adult, downright worldly. The wide-eyed wonder of little Kirth added agreeably to her sense of sophistication. Elise was enjoying every moment. Enjoyment resulted in a leisurely lunch. She lingered indolently at the table, while the coachman and footman tended to the horses outside. A couple of hours passed before she paid her reckoning and left. Off again, and now the time passed slowly. Kareth remained fascinated by the changing scenery, but Elise was bored and already tired of sitting. She was tired of the jolting motion that rattled her teeth despite the cushioned seat. Above all, she was tired of the dust, billowing clouds of fine, dark grit from the road that stung her eyes, chafed her nostrils, clung to her flesh, her hair, and clothing. 
Another six hours of dusty progress, and they came to the Black Sheep Inn on the outskirts of Fl Fluvine, where fresh novelty renewed Elise's flagging interest. For the first time ever, she was to engage a room of her own in a public inn. She took the best and costliest the black sheep could offer, a big chamber filled with massive, old-fashioned oaken furniture, with a separate sleeping closet for, for with a separate sleeping closet for Kerth, and a velvet curtained alcove wherein a wealthy, retiring customer might dine in seclusion if she chose. All the privacy, comfort, and solid respectability in the world, however, could not dispel Elise's sense of low adventure. The chamber in which she would spend the night was, after all, public. There was no telling who might have used it before her, but the possibilities were exciting. The bed she would sleep on had been used by strangers, many of them perhaps not even exalted. The lavender-scented sheets that would actually touch her body had, between washings, encountered unknown and probably common flesh. The sense of intimacy with a faceless populace was piquant, diverting. She dined downstairs that evening, liking the inquisitive attention of the black sheep patrons, liking the bustle, liking the naive excitement of Kirth, who stood behind her chair to serve her throughout the meal. Afterward, however, she found herself at a loss. She could not very well sit up late into the night drinking ale in the common room, and there was little else to do. Somewhat deflated, she repaired to her chamber and found herself obliged for once to resort to reading for recreation. Kirth, who was illiterate, chose a book with a handsome black and red cover for her. It turned out to be Today Tomorrow, Shorvi Nirien's famous attack upon the traditional privileges of the exalted class. Elise accepted the offering with a sigh for she was neither historically aware nor politically inclined. The volume itself she had acquired by surreptitious means, purely for the satisfaction of circumventing her father's proscription. To her, the machinery of government was dry stuff, scarcely worth, worthy of notice, much less contemplation. Apathy notwithstanding, she began to read, and soon to her own surprise, discovered herself caught by Nerian's eloquence and idealism. It will be noted that the period termed the Golden Age of the Populace came to an end at the time of the Jurilin Zenki Wars, when an attack by a league of our foreign foes necessitated centralization of power, apparently justifying the assumption of absolute authority by Dunlas the Great. It was this era that witnessed the true rise of the exalted, whose unusual ability to shape illusion rendered them invaluable in time of war. The support of these talented exalted, having become essential to the security of the Vonarish monarch, Dun Dunulus and his successors, courted the favor of, of their most treasured subjects. Thus the exalted were granted extraordinary privileges, not the least of which lay in total exemption from personal taxation. This exemption inevitably shifted the burden of national expenditure from the exalted, in whose hands by far the greatest share of wealth was already concentrated, entirely onto the shoulders of those least qualified to bear it, the peasant farmers, whose prosperity correspondingly declined. Once begun, the exalted de degradation of the peasant class proceeded apace, the process facilitated by a series of wars, droughts, famines, plagues, and abortive rebellions. Thus he described the origins of the present inequity, as he presumed to term it, and then went on to explain just what he thought should be done to correct it. 
The man was unbalanced, no doubt of that. His dreams of justice and equality demanded nothing less than complete reformation of the entire social structure. A mad, impractical, unrealistic ambition. Yet Nerian's fiery rhetoric kindled powerful emotions. No wonder this renegade lawyer's writings were called inflammatory. No wonder his enemies sought to ban his books, to silence him at any cost. Shorvi Nirien was a visionary of the most dangerous sort. Elise read for two hours, almost a record for her, then snapped the book shut. He'll end upon the gibbet, she He'll end upon the gibbet, she muttered and tossed today tomorrow aside. Nirian's theories were not so easily dismissed, however, and a little later that night, when she lay abed in the dark chamber, his words still rang in her mind. The journey resumed at dawn, and the second day of travel was almost identical to the first, with the same jouncing progress interrupted by rest stops for the horses, a midday meal taken at some undistinguished village inn, then a long, dull stretch before dinner and sleep in the mill town of Berond. The view from the carriage window eventually palled, even for Kareth. Elise and her maid spent endless hours playing at cards and dice for wooden counters, playing at guessing games, at rhyming games, at any games they could remember or invent, with Prince Vauplume curled up in a silken heap on the seat between them. Late in the morning of the third day, they, they crossed from Fabec into the Savang, but the difference was not noticeable, at least not at first. By the middle of the fourth day, however, when they stopped for lunch at the green cockade in Penaud, the menu was distinctly exotic, offering such Sevigny specialties as duck with frolloberry sauce, bolenc sausage, turnip salad, and stuffed pears. The kitchen boy who served up the food spoke with a click, quick clipped Sevigny accent, and he wore a carved bone earring, something never seen on any man north of Barond. To Kareth, it was a revelation. She gazed with wonder at the kitchen boy, whose headlong conversation was all but unintelligible to her. Her round eyes grew rounder yet as they shifted from the earring to the unfamiliar dishes, to the distinctly to, to the distinctively crook-necked bottle of local wine on the table. Elise was similarly impressed, but unwilling to admit it, mostly for Kareth's benefit, for she assumed an air of nonchalance and could not repress a smile of surprised pleasure as she took her first bite of Pinaud tart with its glazed apricots and cherries, toasted almonds, and liqueur-laced custard. The scenery was gradually changing. The steep hills of Fabec had given way to gentler terrain. The roads were smoother, the fields flatter and filled with chestnut cattle of the Sevigny Red strain. The villages were closer together, and the stretches of open countryside were shrinking. A broad silver river appeared to the left of the road. It was the River Veer, and the King's Highway now curved and recurved to follow the water's glinting course. A succession of two-faced villages had sprouted along the river's edge. One face, spotted with inns and taverns, turned to the highway. The other, wharf-nosing out into the river that served as a second highway. The Derivel, car the Derivel carriage no longer traveled alone on the road. There were other vehicles, large and small, many individual riders, and an assortment of pedestrians. Time passed, and a faint smudge marking their destination appeared upon the horizon. The air of Shireen was notoriously foul with smoke.
It was farther away than it looked. Their fifth night was spent at yet another inn. Rising at dawn, they made an early start, traveling alongside the river in the muted, soft-edged cool of the morning. With the sun rose the density of traffic both on land and water. Boats and barges plied the veer, while the number of vehicles kicking up dust on the King's Highway was extraordinary by Derival standards. Around mid-morning they reached Trinier, where they paused briefly. Once an isolated country village, encroached upon and eventually all but engulfed by the growing city of Chirine, Trinier now unofficially existed as an outermost district of the capital. Elise, gazing out at the crowded town square, could sense a new vitality in the air. The people here walked quickly, purposefully. Their gestures were emphatic and animated to the point of exaggeration. Their faces seemed astonishingly mobile, jaws wagging, mouths quirking and pursing, eyebrows jumping, eyes darting, compared to the relatively impassive favic the relatively impassive fabicai, they resembled mimes. And their conversation, so swift, so loud, so incessant, listening, listening to the laughter and chatter from the safety of the Derival Berlin, least could feel her own excitement rise. On rolled the carriage, and the king's highway narrowed to the width of a city street while the buildings grew taller and closer. The traffic, crowds, and noise increased. Never had Elise heard such noise or seen such mobs of noisy, pushy, busy people. The carriages, carts, barrows, sedan chairs, and pedestrians were literally clogging the street, and progress slowed to a crawl. Beggars and hawkers were swarming around, screaming for attention. A few of the more insistent and hideous of the mendicants were actually pawing at the carriage door. Kerthus shrank back from the window. The coachman's whip snapped angrily, and the beggars retreated. A moment later, and they were back again. Alarmed, Elise tossed a handful of copper biquins into the street, and wretched humanity band began to converge from every point of the compass. Then the unseen obstruction cleared, and they began to move again, forward into a square that marked the intersection of five separate streets, and now there could be no doubt that they were truly in Shireen itself. The rough, bumping motion of the carriage suddenly worsened. The great varnished body shook, creaked, and groaned in pain. They had come to the first of paved city streets, and the clatter of their wheels over irregular granite, granite cobbles was deafening. Up ahead loomed the old city wall, and its, with its northern gate thrown wide open, the coach had passed on through, but Elise caught her first sight of something she had often heard of, but never actually witnessed. A stupefaction, one of the vast, mysterious mechanical devices created by the magic of early exalted. Endowed with dull awareness and designed to perform a variety of functions, these devices had once been dubbed the sentient by their ingenious inventors. With the decline of exalted discipline, however, the sentient had fallen into disuse. Disuse had resulted in boredom, followed by apathy, depression, and eventual loss of consciousness. Perhaps the sentient had truly died, but many believed they only slumbered, awaiting an exalted summons to rouse them from their long sleep. The modern term, stupefaction, doubly de described the machine's condition and their astonishing appearance. Such a one still stood at the north gate, created to serve as a watchdog, guarding the city against invasion, 
the stupefaction actually somewhat resembled a crude mechanical dog, with a huge steel barrel of a body set upon four columnar legs, a long segmented neck that must once have been flexible, an outsized head equipped with hinged jaws, immense bulbous eyes concealed behind closed steel lids, and round-dished ears of steel gridwork. Elise gazed, marveling after the bizarre contraption, until it passed from view. Thereafter, she could maintain no further pretense of sophisticated indifference, and did not try. Unashamedly, she gaped out the window at the shops, houses, taverns and cafes, statues, monuments, fountains, and passing Shireenians. This last, perhaps the most interesting spectacle of all, the variety among the pedestrians was remarkable. Within the space of minutes, she glimpsed beggars, peasant laborers, tradesmen and shopkeepers, market women and grisettes, students, liveried servants and footmen, assorted, soberly clad bourgeois, sailors, uniformed gendarmes, royal guardsmen, and shabbily bedizened females who could only have been prostitutes, mingling freely in the streets. Ladies and gentlemen, of course, the quality, the exalted, were less visible, for such folk traveled in carriages and curtained sedan chairs. That fellow exalted were out and about the city, however, could not be doubted, for even as Elise watched, a footman in black and lemon came running down the street shouting, Make way! And behind him came gleaming a brand new yellow carriage with black trim, drawn by four ma matched black horses. So brilliant was the finish on the yellow carriage, so sleek and graceful its lines, that the heavy Daraval equipage appeared ungainly by comparison. As the carriage passed, Elise strained her eyes for the occupant and caught a flashing glimpse of a portly figure, a pale, full-moon face. Who, Miss Elise? Overcame with, overcome with admiration, Kertha had once again forgotten to maintain silence until directly, until directly addressed. Her enthusiasm sometimes overcame her training, but fortunately her new mistress did not mind. In fact, found the spontaneity endearing. Who? Elise had noted the arms blazoned on the yellow carriage, and now she cudgeled her memory. A Vaudieu Villard, I think, she decided. Very old name. Famous in the East. A great fortune. How grand, miss! Will you see him at court when you go? Quite likely, Elise replied with studied unconcern, but could not resist adding for the sake of effect. I shall see them all, including the king himself, no doubt. And you shall see them too, child. Kill me dead! Are we going now, miss? To the king's palace? Now? Of course not. But aren't you to be maid of honor to the queen? Yes, but not today. Oh, very good then. Uh, maybe you could tell me, Miss Elise, what is the maid of honor anyway? Well, in the first place, you mustn't say the maid of honor as if I were to be the only one. There are twelve maids, young ladies of good family, chosen to wait upon the queen. Wait upon her how, miss? Attend her at all times, provide companionship, help her to dress, to undress, to bathe, carry her messages, run her errands, perform her bidding, smooth her path. Oh, you mean you're to be in service as ladies made to the queen like I am to you, miss? <laughs> in service as ladies made? Disliking the sound of it, Elise tossed her head. Certainly not. We are speaking of the queen, remember? Attending her is a great honor, a privilege reserved for the fortunate. 
It's nothing like servitude. But you're to do the, the same things just for her as I do for you, it sounds like, miss. It may sound that way, but I assure you there's all the difference in the world. Don't be such an infant, Kareth. Yes, miss. The carriage was rolling along a narrow, littered street lined with indifferently prosperous wine shops, cook shops, pawn shops, and tenements. Quite suddenly, it emerged from the shadows into a sunlit circle of handsome old houses with a little round fence park at the center where children played under the supervision of their starched, frilled nurses. The contrast was startling, and the words burst from Elise. I love Shireen. Me too, miss, said Kareth. Will we go by the king's palace, do you suppose? I've no idea. It's a good thing Coachman knows his way around this place, for to me it seems a great maze. I'm afraid I'll never learn it. And why you should, you needn't to bother, miss, when there'll always be carriages to carry you anywhere you want to go? Yes, that's true. The carriage clattered on past the circular park, up the street, and through an enormous open area whose white marble mountment, monument and columns surmounted by eagles marked the famous Dunulus Square, then on into a region of large and classically beautiful townhouses built of cream-colored stone. Again, forgetful of propriety, Kareth once more initiated conversation. If we're not to go to the king's palace today, miss, then where are we going? To my grandmother Zara Len, my mother's mother. We're to stay for we're to stay with her for now. Your granny Well that's nice, miss. That's very nice. Fond of her, are you? I've never met her. She's never vis visited Daravel. I hope we'll get on. Oh, most likely you will, miss. Grannies are generally decent sorts of people. I remember my own gran. She'd lost her teeth, and she was so ugly her face looked like a cow stepped on it, and she smoked and sucked on a dirty old clay pipe so her breath stank something fierce, but a nicer, sweeter, pleasanter old thing you'd never find. Well, I don't think my grandmother will be anything like that, Elise interrupted. She's a great lady, a countess in her own right, famous once, and said to be the greatest beauty of her day— she must have been, because she was mistress to the king's father, and before that, to his grandfather, the mistress entitled to two kings. Not simultaneously, I don't think. The what, miss? The mistress in title, the acknowledged mistress. Kareth's eyes remained blank, and Elise added, That is to say, she was more or less the king's wife, in all but name, she was not the queen, but she enjoyed Yes, and over fifty years ago she bore Dinulus Ninth a son, who would have been a duke if he'd lived. Comprehension dawned at last. You mean to say, Kirth stammered, red-faced, that your old granny's a harlot? No, of course not. Hold your tongue, Elise was similarly red-faced. She served the king, and that is a great honor, as well as a duty. Don't you understand that? It's not what you said. I assure you, there's all the difference in the world. Really, you are such an infant. I guess I just don't understand, Miss Elise, but I'm trying. Maybe it will all make sense when I see your gran. That will be any moment. I think we've arrived. The carriage had stopped on an immaculate tree-lined avenue before a great cream-stone townhouse of dauntingly perfect proportions. Elise wondered if its owner would prove equally daunting and perfect. Thank you for listening to Orion's Bedtime Stories podcast. We hope you've enjoyed it and that you have a lovely, relaxing evening. Thank you, and sweet dreams. <laughs>